All right, this is the timeline video for period three. Period three goes from 1754 to 1800. What you will be doing is writing down the events in order. If there's any facts or information that you feel is relevant, make sure to jot those down along with those events. All right, so 1754, and the reason why this event, or the reason why this period starts in 1754 is because of the French and Indian War. That started in 1754. It started with George Washington going and taking back land from the French for necessity, and then the French retaliating. Eventually, the British are going to join. It's actually going to become a huge event between the British and the French. The French are going to lose. They're going to be kicked out of North America, and uh, that is going to be the big cause of uh, the American Revolution because of a couple different factors, but the first is going to be Pontiac Rebellion. Since the French and Native Americans were best friends, all of a sudden the French are gone. The Native Americans are very upset they're not involved with the Treaty of Paris, which ended the French and Indian War. Pontiac, who is a Native American leader, is going to lead this large rebellion, and the British are going to have to come in and save the colonists from the Native Americans. The British don't like having to constantly, constantly militarily come in and save them from the Native Americans, so they pass the Proclamation of 1763. This was uh, a border that the colonists could not cross. This made the colonists very upset because they fought in the French and Indian War mainly for the land that now they were not allowed to take. And they felt like the British were ending salutary neglect and forcing them to do things they did not want to do. That included as well, pay for the war. 1765, the Stamp Act comes out. The Stamp Act was a tax on all printed materials, but its goal was to have the colonists pay for a big portion of the French and Indian War. It made, the war had made the British almost bankrupt and they needed new money, and they were using taxes for that money. The colonists saw that, and they hated it, and they started to protest. These protests are going to become violent, and the British troops are going to arrive in Boston three years later. Now, you got to understand that the first shots fired in the American Revolution wasn't until 1775, so British troops were in Boston for seven full years before the first shots were fired. Now, one of these violent protests that got out of hand was the Boston Massacre. This is where the British fired uh, into a crowd, killing five people. You can see that depicted by Sam Adams right here. Uh, it did not look quite this way. Um, there was uh, lots of throwing of objects at the British protesters, but this picture was drawn by Sam Adams as a form of propaganda to get colonists upset with the British and join the cause. 1773, there's going to be a Tea Act. This was uh, a monopoly that the British Crown was placing all taxes on tea except for their own tea, and their own tea was not very good. The colonists are going to get upset about this and dump all the tea into the Boston Harbor. This is going to make the king very mad, and it's going to lead to the Intolerable Acts. The Intolerable Acts basically put the Boston or put Boston on military control. It shut down the Boston Harbor. And this actually made all the other 12 colonies feel bad for Massachusetts. And this is when colonies started to come together with the first Continental Congress. Here you can see this picture. This is Patrick Henry standing up saying, give me liberty or give me death. A very, very passionate plea that the colonies needed to do something against the British. All the colonies showed up <clears throat> except for Georgia. And... Um, they decided that they would begin to stockpile weapons and train militias to fight the British. Now, obviously that's gonna make the British a little bit uncomfortable. Eventually they're gonna to try to go and get some of these weapons that the colonists were stockpiling. And that leads to the Battle of Lexington and Concord. This is Paul Revere's famous midnight ride. The British are coming, the British are coming, coming for these weapons. The colonies or the colonists get the weapons and they meet the British in battle for the first time, shot heard around the world. This is kind of the first, the unofficial start of the American Revolution. The reason why it's the unofficial start is because there was this big battle between colonists themselves if they actually wanted to be at war or not. This immediately though leads to the Second Continental Congress. And at the Second Continental Congress, the Continental Army is created. So all the colonies are going to donate a certain portion of tax revenue to create uh, an army and George Washington is going to head up that army. That then leads to what I would consider like the first intense battle, which is the Battle of Bunker Hill. And this is when the British invaded Boston. 
Uh, this was where George Washington said, don't shoot until you see the white of their eyes. They uh, had point blank range at the British and the British kept coming. This showed that the British were serious about war against the colonies, that they felt like the colonies were an actual open rebellion against them. And that led to the Olive Branch Petition, which is where some colonies wrote to King George and apologized for the actions of their brethren and that they were loyal subjects to him. He never saw it because he burned the letter before even reading any of it. This really meant that war was going to be the only option. Colonists are still a little um, fearful of war until Thomas Paine's Common Sense comes out in January 1776, where he basically laid out common arguments that anyone could understand that the colonists were already at war. When the British thought of the colonies, they didn't think about them differently. They thought about them all together. So all the colonies were at war. And this gained massive uh, support for the rebellion. People wanted to rebel now. And Payne laid out that rebellion would be a good thing for America. July of that same year, 1776, we have the Declaration of Independence was written by the Committee of Five. Thomas Jefferson is the main drafter of this Declaration of Independence. And this, at this point, the colonies are fully at war. Every colonist uh, or every uh, colony had representation signed this Declaration of Independence, uh, showing that the colonies were declaring that they wanted to be free from the British and that war was going to be the action. Not too long after that, the content or the Articles of Confederation was created. This was the first uh, form of government for the colonies. It uh, established that the colonies would still have like their own system of power. Uh, the federal government would be very, very weak. You can actually see this picture. It kind of shows all the powers that the federal government doesn't have. And you got to understand that this is because colonists are fearful of a powerful federal government. They want power to be localized in their colony or in their state. And this is not going to last very long, but it is the first form of government, and it does get them through the war. That uh, same year in the winter is Valley Forge. This was a training camp for George Washington and his troops, Marquise de Lafayette, Baron von Steuben. They were all there as well. Uh, and this is where the soldiers really train themselves up to become a uh, fightable force against the British. And this culminates in October 1781 in the Battle of Yorktown. This is where George Cornwallis of the British is surrounded by French and American troops, and he has to surrender. It's an incredibly embarrassment, a uh, big embarrassment for the British, and uh, it is going to lead to the Treaty of Paris, which made the United States free. Not too long after that, that Articles of Confederation is going to have some big problems because uh, there's going to be rebellions that cannot be put down by the states, uh, and it's going to show that they need a stronger form of government. The big example of that is Shays' Rebellion, 1786. So the following year, they're going to come together to revise the Articles of Confederation, potentially put in more federal power for it. And it ultimately, uh, they decide that they're just going to scrap the whole thing and create a new form of government called the Constitution. Uh, and the Constitution is going to have a lot more federal power. This is going to cause some people to be a little fearful of it. But we'll talk more about that in a second. At the same time, this is something I just like to show. Uh, the Northwest Ordinance is adopted. This was still under the Articles of Confederation. So just because they were revising this Constitution uh, didn't mean that the Articles of Confederation went completely away. This is one of the most notable things. Northwest Ordinance was dividing this land that the uh, colonies had won from the British at the end of the American Revolution this Ohio Valley and how they were going to make it in two states. It's notable because it also got rid of slavery in these new territories. So I said that there were some people who were um, a little fearful of this new powerful government and they needed to be convinced of it. And so because of that, Alexander Hamilton, along with James Madison and John Jay wrote the Federalist Papers, which was a collection of essays that were written out to explain why the Constitution was a good thing and why America needed the Constitution. It did its job and the Constitution is going to be ratified in March of 1788. That next year, George Washington is elected president. He ran basically unopposed. 
Um, and he is going to serve two terms, so eight years. That following year, the reason why anti-federalists are going to be okay with the Constitution was because of the Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments, and basically it started to take some of the power away from the federal government. The Constitution gave a lot of power to the federal government. The first 10 amendments, if you think about the first 10 amendments, they slowly start to take some of that power away to create a nice balance that we've had last for over 200 years. Now in the middle of Washington's presidency, something that's gonna take place, is Thomas Jefferson is going to resign as Secretary of State. This is because he had big problems with Alexander Hamilton and this starts to create our first political parties. Hamilton is gonna represent the Federalists. These are these guys who want a powerful federal government. They're kind of afraid of mob rule. And Thomas Jefferson is going to represent the Anti-Federalists, also known as the Democrat Republicans. And these guys are going to represent your quote unquote average person um, who don't want a lot of federal oversight over their life. 1774, there's going to be the Whiskey Rebellion. This is always nice to compare to Shays Rebellion. Shays Rebellion got so big that the federal government couldn't put it down. This picture is showing George Washington actually riding into battle to put down the Whiskey Rebellion. And the Whiskey Rebellion was a tax on whiskey. The frontier farmers actually had a big problem with that. Tennessee, Kentucky, they're making all the whiskey. They feel like these coastal elites are forcing them to have to pay these high taxes. They rebel. Washington's able to put it down, and this shows that the federal government is powerful enough to handle itself. It also shows a conflict between rural parts of the country, or this frontier part of the country, and the East Coast. 1796, uh, John Adams is going to be elected our second president. He was also a Federalist. He was the vice president to George Washington. So it's kind of a continuation of George Washington's terms, except for John Adams is going to do a, we'll just say not great job at being president. He's basically going to kill the Federalist Party. One of the reasons for why that is, is the XYZ affair that takes place in his first year in office. This is where France was upset with us because we uh, had signed a treaty with the British called Jay's Treaty, which had given them money. And so they began to kidnap our ships, it became a whole big thing. We actually got into kind of like a quasi war with them, which is where we did not declare war on France. France did not declare war on us, but we were very much pissed at one another. Um, this caused John Adams to then pass this. And this is the Alien and Sedition Acts. And this is where you could not speak bad about the government. And you also, we could uh, deport foreigners and the people that we're really looking to deport at this point is maybe the French, who um, John Adams felt like were maybe trying to come in to subvert uh, the US government or try to take down the US government from within. This is a massive overreach in federal power. This is actually the exact thing that Thomas Jefferson was afraid of, which is why. That same year, he wrote this, the Kentucky and Virginia Resolutions, which is where Virginia and Kentucky basically said that if they saw a law that they did not agree with, that they would just nullify it. They would not follow it. And this cannot happen. State law uh, is less powerful than federal law. But this starts to set up this big battle between the federal government and state governments, which is ultimately going to lead to a climax in the Civil War. Civil War is kind of this big culminating event of federal government saying that you can't have slavery and states saying that states' rights we can have slavery. Ultimately, the Alien and Sedition Acts are going to kill the Federalist Party, though. Uh, the Federalist Party is going to be seen as elite and out of touch. And um, because of that, 1800, Thomas Jefferson is elected president. This is the first time that we have a power change, meaning the Federalists are not going to be in power anymore. Instead, it's going to be the Democrat Republicans, which is why this is called the Revolution of 1800. All right. And that is your timeline.